Hello, Pod Fam. Welcome to another episode of The Tea with Laura and Rachel. Today, we have a very special guest. She is an OBGYN resident at the University of British Columbia, a campaign organizer for Access BC, and a passionate reproductive health activist, also global health and advocacy, Dr. Ruth Habte. Welcome to the show, Ruth. What are you drinking with us today? Thanks so much. So happy to be here. I'm having a Timmy's Deep Tea, one of my favorite with just a little bit of milk. I love it. That's that's so Canadian of you as well. (laughs) (laughs) Gotta have some Timmy's. Yeah. Yeah, that's really one of our favorites too. So yeah. Well, before we get into um, the questions and learn a bit more about you, can you tell me what you're having, Laura? Yes, I am having a puer macchiato tea. So it's kind of coffee Ooh. flavored, but I just felt like I needed a little bit of caffeine as we record this episode. So mm-hmm. if I start getting like a little little jittery, the, the okay. caffeine's kicking in. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Rachel, what are you drinking? Laura, you're going to love this, but um, I brought the peppermint tea back. Oh my God. It feels like oh. It's been forever. I know it's because of the fact that I drank all of my chamomile tea, which replaced the peppermint tea. So now we're we're back on the on this train. Excellent. I so. love when you bring out a classic. All right, Ruth, let's get right into it. So tell us a little bit about yourself. What led you to becoming an OBGYN? And more specifically, how did you become a leader in reproductive justice? So I'm a first-generation Canadian. Um, I'm born to um, hardworking immigrant and refugee parents. My mom immigrated. My dad was a government-sponsored refugee um, to the country. So I was born and raised in Winnipeg, Manitoba, but I live in Vancouver now for residency. I'm just visiting Ontario to do some um, electives for my uh, residency. Um, I was drawn, drawn to OBGYN for a lot of reasons, but... Mostly I was interested in working in the maternal child health kind of reproductive health space. I really wanted advocacy to be at the forefront of whatever work I was doing. And I love that OBGYN kind of encompassed both doing medical treatments as well as providing surgical options for people and working with my hands. And so that's how I kind of got into that. I would say that I've always kind of been an outspoken person on issues of injustice. Um, When I moved to BC kind of specifically, I very quickly connected with the Access BC campaign. And soon after that took on a leadership role with them. And the um, experiences that I've had with patients um, in terms of having difficulty accessing contraception related to me being a pharmacist and seeing how difficult it was for some people to fill those medications. I just, I knew that I had to do something about it. And the fact that the Access BC campaign had already been formed was something that I, I wanted to be a part of. And really it's the patients that I am taking care of that I you know see suffering as a result of not being able to access contraception or other services, what have you, um, is really what pushes me to keep going in this reproductive justice space. For sure. That's been something that, as Laura and I have been doing more research into reproductive rights and reproductive justice in Canada, because we hadn't really looked into it that much before, we were like, oh yeah, like in Ontario, until you're 25, we have free birth control. Mm -hmm. Interesting. All right. But then, you know, you kind of get into your bubble where you're like, okay, well, this is my province. It must be this way everywhere. And then you expand that viewpoint and you're like, oh, it's really not. But then you're also like, oh, but why does it end at 25? Yeah. In our province, at least, because, you know, if anything, that's the time where people really need it as well, because they're Mm. getting they're still like building their careers and all of this. There was a really, really great talk that both Laura and I listened to that you did, I think it was last November, that we will uh, link it in the show notes. And you brought up this great distinction that I would love for you to explain to us. And that is what the difference is between the concept of reproductive rights and reproductive justice. Yeah. And I admittedly, um, before getting into the reproductive justice space, I really didn't realize how much of a difference and distinction there was between the two. And so I'm really happy to explain both of them. So reproductive rights is really talking about laws. So 
does the law prohibit someone from getting an abortion, allow someone to get an abortion if they want? Does the law allow you know, people to have access to reproductive health care in the form of contraception? Is it something that's outlawed in the country? And that was a movement that was really started by working class white women. And so a lot of that has to do with women's bodies typically being controlled by the patriarchy and people wanting to have the right to have an abortion, to have, you know, a contraceptive option. So reproductive justice has a little bit of a different history. So it was started by um, women of color who felt like the reproductive rights movement did not encompass everything that they needed. They felt like it was missing aspects of access that, you know, even though there were laws at the time when this movement started in the early 90s, people in their community still didn't have meaningful access to reproductive health care in the form of abortions, in the form of HIV care, and in the form of pregnancy care. And so reproductive justice really looks at not only the laws, but having meaningful access to care in the sense of, you know, giving people the right to have children, the right to not have children if that's what they want, and the right to raise their children in healthy environments. And so that's how the two kind of movements differ, um, both really important, but different, um, different movements. Yeah, and Ruth, I just kind of wanted to pause on the right for people to have children because I think this is an interesting thing that has come up as we've been talking more and more about the right to not have children. I have seen a lot of commentary about um, people choosing to have a child or go through with a pregnancy and maybe they're not financially able, like uh, stable enough to or um, any any situation. There are so many different situations, just as on the other side, there's so many situations why someone can choose not to complete a pregnancy. And I'm finding that a lot of people are, are saying like, well, if, if you can't financially support a child or a family or whatever situation, you know, you should have an abortion. But really like no one has that right to take away that opportunity from someone. And Mm -hmm. I felt like we just, we, I wanted to bring that up because it's, it's been coming up so much in, in different content that I've seen of um, people still trying to put their choice of what they would do Mm -hmm. on other people. And I think that's what reproductive justice is really about. It's allowing the individual to have their choice. Definitely, and allowing the individual to have complete freedom in the choice that they're, you know, making. So um, a choice really isn't there if the person is, you know, forced by their parent, forced by their partner to have an abortion or not have an abortion. The choice really isn't there if the patient or the person, pardon me, so used to medical talk, um, is forced to give up their child or, you know, keep their child um if that's, you know, either of those is not something that they want to do. And so, you know, I think it's really important that we keep in mind um, what the downstream effects of forcing people into either continuing on with a pregnancy when they don't want to continue on with a pregnancy. I think um, there's a lot of good evidence out there that shows that people who wanted an abortion and were not able to get an abortion have um, lower high school graduation rates, lower kind of income rates moving forward. And then, you know, that being people who have pregnancies that are unintended are more likely to have children who have then pregnancies that are unintended. Um, And so I think there's really a downstream effect from that, but there's also a downstream effect from the opposite. So if someone chooses to parent and is not supported in parenting, and let's say, you know, they raise this child in poverty because they really have access to no means to take care of this child, well, then the child themselves, when they grow up, is more likely to be in poverty and more likely to continue on in this cycle of poverty. And so, 
you know, I, I think we have to be really mindful as a society that, um, you know, people should have the freedom to choose, you know, whether that be an abortion, whether that be to, you know, give a child up for adoption, whether that be to, you know, parent a child. Um, and that we really need to, as Sister uh, Song would say, kind of look at a framework that encompasses analyzing power systems. So really taking an intersectional approach, centering the most marginalized in our community and um, having a collective call to action. When it comes to, you know, people having children that maybe they're, you know, have financial difficulties, well, you know, the government solution is then taking this child away from that person and providing funds to somebody else to raise that child. So if they would have, you know, given, you know, this family programs to begin with, then maybe that wouldn't have been a problem. Maybe they would have, you know, been able to keep this family together and um, that wouldn't have been an issue. And so, you know, I think um, people have a lot of opinions. Yes. <laughs> yeah. About yes. reproductive health care. People have a lot of opinions about um, when people should have children, how many children they should have, whether or not they're, you know, capable of taking care, care of them, have a lot of judgment to give about different parenting styles. Mm -hmm. But realistically, it should be someone's choice. They should have complete freedom in making that choice, should be forced into making, you know, a choice and should be supported in that. And that's a lot of what reproductive justice, you know, has to, to say about the topic. Mm -hmm. And I really like the point that you just made at the end, uh, towards the end about how if the social programs were available to parents, then a lot of the time this wouldn't be an issue. And mm. that's something that comes up a lot with the anti-choice movement is that from our perspective, it doesn't capture the broad view that needs to be given because it's like, oh, well, adoption is an option. Mm -hmm. And it's just like, okay, but we have to also look at the fact that a lot of the time people might need an abortion because of financial reasons and because they don't have support from their community and from the government and such, they simplify how complex that solution is mm -hmm. when it's actually very complicated and it's not as easy as just like, oh yeah, they could go into adoption or if something didn't work out like foster care exists, but why would you give a stranger funds to take care of this child, but not the parents? I agree, super, super confusing and super frustrating to, you know, sometimes have conversations with people who are trying to bring this argument down to a really kind of like black and white mm -hmm. type of argument when realistically, you know, I can only make decisions for myself. You guys, you, you too, pardon me, can only make decisions, you know, for yourselves. And I would expect nothing less for, you know, people who have organs that are capable of reproducing, you know, they're the ones who get to make those decisions for themselves. It's not me. You know, I think us as a society, we just need to be supportive. And yeah. so it's so difficult sometimes having those conversations when, you know, people, like you said, just try to simplify things down when really it's not a simple concept. Yeah, no, that's exactly right. And um, this is something Rachel and I had talked at the end of the previous abortion episode that, you know, we we grew up with, um, I'm going to call it a checklist in our mind of, you know, okay, if I was in this situation where I became pregnant, what is the decision I'm going to make about that. And mm -hmm. we had uh, changing reasons for that. And um, like, I know for, for us now, we're a little bit more established in our career. So we're like, okay, you know, financially with our mm -hmm. partners, we might be able to make this work, but we're still on the cusp of, you know, maybe it's not, it's not the right time. And that's our, you know, narrative and our choice. You know, we have no right to put that narrative on on anyone else. And I, I feel like exactly. a lot of people need to remember that a little bit. Like being pro-choice is not being like, okay, I think we're all for abortion and we agree that it's a right choice for for society, but we're not gonna like go like the pro-birth people of being like, it's the right choice for everyone. Cause it's not. Exactly. It's not. Exactly. 
it's not a one size fits all. And, you know, I think it's at the end of the day, it's someone's choice to make, just like pro choice says, I will support you regardless of, you know, what choices people make. Exactly. So you noted that meaningful access is a pillar of the reproductive justice movement. I want to really dive into this because, you know, in our country, abortions are legal and so is contraception. But why is it just because this is legal to us, meaningful access isn't guaranteed? And particularly, how does this impact our rural communities, our northern communities and indigenous communities in Canada? Yeah, so I would say, um, you know, there's no law that bans abortion in Canada, which means that abortion remains a decision that is made between um, a patient and the doctor. Um, And so with that being said, it's usually on a province-wide basis that, you know, the doctors who are able to provide those services, whether it be medical or surgical terminations of pregnancy, make a decision as to what gestational age they're comfortable doing these procedures up until. And so, you know, I would say that's a good framework overall to have for reproductive um, health care and that means. That being said, just because in British Columbia, where I am training, um, the gestational age limit is 24 weeks and six days, which is some of the most liberal across the country. Just because we, you know, have allow, you know, abortions to happen up until that gestational age for, you know, um, not an indication that was related to the, to the patient's health themselves or to a, you know, lethal anomaly or something like that, just for choice, doesn't mean that everyone is able to access it equally. When you think about where it is, for example, just in British Columbia, these programs are centered in Vancouver, right? And so people in Surrey, for example, which Surrey is the largest growing population in all of Canada, um, they don't have their own abortion clinic. They have to come into Vancouver to have these services done. I think something very similar could be said for most provinces in Canada where access to Um, at least the surgical options are pretty limited to larger centers. Um, And certainly access to medical abortion in smaller centers might be hampered by the fact that, sure, you can do telehealth and have a physician from Vancouver prescribe you, um, you know, the abortion pill in northern Manitoba. Sure, no problem. It's something that could be done over telehealth. But where will you get that medication from? You know, is the pharmacy, um, is there one pharmacy in your town? And, you know, you're getting a medication from a pharmacist that you, you know, went to high school with or something like that. You know, I just feel that in smaller communities, it's a lot more difficult to have that anonymity that's sometimes, you know, really needed in these scenarios. I think that's even more so the case in northern regions where there's even less access to healthcare facilities and pharmacies. Um, And then specifically in Indigenous communities where we know that Indigenous folks um, have, status Indigenous folks, pardon me, have access to all contraceptive options at no cost already on top of, you know, having the same health benefits in terms of access to abortion care. That being said, having the right to free contraception and having the right to abortion still does not guarantee that Indigenous folks have the same access as everyone else. You know, Indigenous folks might live on a reserve where there's only a nursing station. No one's able to prescribe these medications. No one's skilled in performing these procedures if it's an abortion. Maybe no one is skilled in inserting a Mirena IUD, copper IUD, or in one of those implants. And so it's not the same for everyone, just based on geography, based on being a racialized person, and especially an Indigenous person. And so that in a nutshell is why, you know, just because something is legal, access really isn't guaranteed. Yeah. And one thing that I really never considered until you said it was the stigma around small towns. You know, as you were saying it, I'm just like, okay, the town where I grew up, I actually went to school with the pharmacist. Like, (laughs) 
in my grade type of thing, was friends with. And I, I could just see where so many people would be afraid of being judged mm-hmm. or just, you know, like, um, I know there legally there's a confidentiality, but in a small town, things get out, right? And For sure. It, it, news could just travel and um, it's stuff that, you know, you don't want getting out there, like depending on who you are. Maybe that's something you want to keep private or it's a very emotional situation because maybe you wanted that pregnancy. You're not able to carry it to term and you're dealing with this emotional trauma and now you have half the town talking about it. Exactly. Yeah, that's just something I um, didn't even – like it makes so much sense. I just didn't think Mm -hmm. of it at first when when talking about access and and actually going to to get this this medication or prescription – Totally. If you are in a small town. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And something that always hits me about this too is how so many of these center, you know, it is legal in our country and a lot of provinces have very liberal gestational limits. But mm-hmm. most of like the densest population in Canada is towards the border, the southern border. Mm-hmm. And it always strikes me where it's just like, you know, like for Laura and I, maybe it would be max a two hour, two and a half hour drive for us to get somewhere if we were coming from our hometown. But mm-hmm. like going to maybe BC and Alberta, where the geography is pretty crazy. Everything is minimum eight hours, I've noticed. Yeah. Minimum eight hours, eight hours plus. <laughs> and that's not like, that's just travel time. But say the people that are working up there are only working hourly and they can't afford to take that time off to travel down south somewhere and it's just like it's it's difficult and I remember us we had done some reading too where in a lot of those rural smaller communities there's more crisis pregnancy centers there than there are mm-hmm. abortion care Direct clinics health care exactly it's crazy. so it just it's, it's so predatory yeah it's like taking advantage of people at their most vulnerable and it's just it makes me really sad it so it really does We kind of want to go back to contraception a little bit. And how does contraception not being covered by most provincial healthcare plans impact marginalized communities? You know, I think that similar to what we were talking about, so when any law or policy is put in place related to reproductive health care and anything is restricted in any way, it's always the most marginalized in our communities that suffer. So it's always people who are, you know, in what we call the working poor, so people who have a day job but make just enough money that they're deductible for whatever provincial health plan pharmacare benefit they have is sufficiently high that they would never reach it just based on contraceptive kind of options alone. Um, It's teenagers, I mean, maybe not in Ontario, but in, you know, British Columbia, where I work now, in Manitoba, where I did my training. Um, People of color who um, historically have had harder access to these vital medications, maybe related to language and immigration status, maybe, you know, just not being able to navigate the healthcare system in the same way. And so it, you know, it really is them who is harmed the most by these policies. I would say everyone stands to benefit from a universal access to contraceptive plan. Um, but it is the most marginalized who serve to benefit the most. Yes, absolutely. And this is going back a few years ago, but um, the price of birth control, it's it's not cheap. Um, I remember it being like minimum, I think, $50 a month. And usually you would get several, like maybe three months at a time. So that's $150 all in one go. And for someone who is living paycheck to paycheck or barely making the bills, that's a large sum of money that, you know, they might just have to be like, you know what, forget it. I'm going to just, you know, hope for the best. And that's mm-hmm. that's not how our country should operate. It should be like, no, I'm trying to work. I'm trying to provide for myself or my, my family. And mm-hmm. I now have the security that if I do not want to have children, I'm 
not going to have children. Like I, I have this protection. Mm-hmm. For sure. And I would say probably the cheapest you could get contraceptive pills if you got a three-month supply, you know, keeping in mind the dispensing fee, got the generic version, is about maybe $60 for three months. Yeah. Um, So about $20 a month if you get a three-month supply. Or if you didn't, then maybe more around like the $30 a month. Mm Mm-hmm. Um, The cheapest you could get a Mirena IUD in British Columbia anyways is around 375 but more likely in the $400 mark. Same thing with the Kylena IUD, so both the medicated ones. Copper, you could get as cheap as 75 but can go upwards from there. Um, mm. And so it's, you know, it just becomes very difficult to have to put that money up front. Mm-hmm. You know, even if it's pills, it's still fairly expensive for someone it who is. doesn't have the means. Yeah. And just a question yeah. on, on IUDs, you know, what if you're in a rural town or, or anywhere really, it doesn't matter where you are and you don't have a doctor. So mm-hmm. does that even just like, does that just cross IUD right off the list for you? Or is there something um, people can do? Like, can they go to a walk-in clinic and have an IUD inserted or how, do, how would that work for someone who does not have a family doctor? Yeah. And the issue of not having a family doctor is so prevalent in British Columbia. I would say um, it depends on the training and the skill level of the doctor. So myself as a OBGYN resident doctor, I put in so many IUDs, I can definitely put in an IUD for somebody. Yeah. But if, you know, let's say this is a GP working in a walk-in clinic who really doesn't even do pap smears, maybe, you know, as a walk-in clinic person, you know, are they, you know, able to actually do the insertion process, which involves like, you know, finding the cervix, cleansing the cervix, making sure you know which direction the uterus is in, and a couple of kind of like procedural motions to be able to put it in correctly. Are they able to provide the follow-up care that's needed, you know, making sure Um, that the person has someone to contact if they're having irregular bleeding or concerns related to it. And, you know, I would say a lot of healthcare providers either aren't trained to do insertions or just were trained and don't feel comfortable continuing to offer it. And um, it's really unfortunate because I think it's, you know, a great option if that's what somebody wants. But that is the case, unfortunately, the atmosphere that we have right now. Mm Mm-hmm. And um, I, I actually have some an experience to share with this too, because I do have the Kylina IUD, mm-hmm. and I was lucky enough that I did have a family doctor who, you know, mm-hmm. she prescribed it for me. That was great, but you know, I was in a new relationship that, mm-hmm. and it took me um, just, you know, touching on the issue of having a family doctor and also just getting. Into, in front of the right person for the care you need, mm-hmm. I think it took six months mm-hmm. for the doctor who was supposed to do, um, do the procedure to even mm-hmm. contact me to book a yeah. consultation, and then another two yeah. months after that. And then um, when we have the follow-up ultrasound to make sure that everything's in the right place and there's no mm-hmm. punctures, et cetera, et cetera, it was another six months before they could take me in for that. And it's just one of those moments where you're like, well, I hope that nothing's wrong. Yeah, I guess. Like it's it's really hard. And, you know, I find um, with IUDs especially, like I had been on hormonal birth control for a while. So like I knew what research I needed to do for mm-hmm. this because I'm like, okay, I did the pill. I didn't do a lot of research on that. I really need to do the research on this. But then I think of, you know, like young people like teenagers and such that don't have that life experience yet to do that research but then they're they aren't entering a very um conducive environment to help them because either they're not being at all or they're being Mm -hmm. rushed through the process and i i would i would actually really love to like go back to young people and just contraception as a whole right now, because a great case that could be made is oftentimes teenagers. And I I think it's, I don't know if it's the same in Canada, but for a lot of like health plans 
that cover like prescriptions and stuff, you can be covered under your parents until you're like 25 or something. Yeah. But basically their parents have to know that their 17 year old daughter is going to the doctor to get a prescription for hormonal birth control or an IUD. And it's just like, that's not acknowledging the case where they don't have rent, like good parents. Maybe their yeah. parents are very controlling and they don't want that to happen. Or I think you talked about it in your talk that we watched them. Um, the what's the plan in BC? The Pharmacare? Is it Pharmacare? that you know teenagers are held to their parents' income. So if they're from a mm-hmm. high earning exactly. household, they mm-hmm. don't get that coverage. So then they can't go out and get that prescription filled. And it's just like that's really like almost the time where people need that access the most because exactly. they they are not established in life at all. Mm-hmm. And, you know, just to further what you've said, I would say most private insurance plans will allow a dependent to be on until age 25. So someone's child, if they're a full-time student, so usually it's up to 18 regardless, and then 18 to 25 is dependent on the full-time student status. But people have portals or what have you where they can see what was done for each person on their plan. So they can see that their teenager has filled this drug identification number, you know, X number of pills, X amount of, you know, supply. Um, And sure, maybe it won't say the name of the product, but it's easy enough to look up what the drug identification number is and figure out what what they're filling, you know, regardless of if the pharmacy, you know, the pharmacy is not sharing this information with the family, the family is still very much able to, to get access to that. And so it's, yeah, really not a great system. Yeah, it kind of removes the confidentiality from that medical relationship. Exactly. The pharmacist isn't sharing that information, but the parents still have access to it anyway. It's a very flawed system. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> Let's move on to another flaw. Um, oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, so how does reproductive justice work towards securing the right to parent? I know we kind of already touched on this a little bit earlier, um, but how does it relate most to Canada specifically within Indigenous communities? I'd kind of like to go back there a little bit. Yeah, definitely. So, you know, I would just reiterate the you know, what Sister Song has kind of on this. So that framework that really encompasses looking at power systems, making sure you're taking an intersectional approach, centering the most marginalized. um, And it's really, you know, a really a call to action in that, you know, no one is free until we're all free. That's kind of the very basic tenant of reproductive justice. You know, I would say Indigenous communities have come up with a lot of solutions on their own, that being, you know, the truth and reconciliation calls to action that um, we as a community have just not put into place. Um, I think it's something that we definitely need to strive towards. It's something that with any holiday we should be remembering and trying to put into place. And, you know, Indigenous folks have like laid out the roadmap and we really just need to follow along with what those recommendations are. And so it's, um, it's just, yeah, one of those things. Yeah. And I think we also really need to respect their own decisions as well when it comes to birth. You know, our system is just like, we have the right way to birth a child, you know, it has to be in our hospital, in our system around people who you don't know, but really these communities, you know, they have generations and generations of knowledge of how they have birthed children. And it's, it's a place where they, like, they feel safe. They feel surrounded by their loved ones and the rest of their community. And Canada really needs to do a better job at honoring that and, and giving them the option to have their child in that environment instead of being pulled completely out of it into a very, mm-hmm. Um, cold areas like to them it would be so cold our mm-hmm. our way of doing things exactly and I think you know there has been a movement towards bringing birth back to communities I'm sure it's nowhere where you know it needs to be but certainly 
We have a lot of promising stories coming um, out of a number of different communities. And I think a big part of that is um, the number of Indigenous midwives and making sure that people who are from these communities are able to access training, if that's what they want to do, to be able to provide that service for you know their own communities. And so, yeah, I agree. Yeah, and just also giving them like, not the facility, but just uh, the resources, the resources, like any resources yeah. they may need to to help keep this as a as a safe process as well. Exactly. You know, clean exactly. water and, yeah. you know, all those Access basic to resources. sterilized equipment. Yeah, sterilized you know? equipment, sure. you know. Yeah, like anything that we would have access to in our system, but in their environment. Exactly. And, you know, like access to being transferred if something did happen, you know, like safety measures that were put in place, um, you know, making sure that the lowest risk members of, com- of the community are the ones who are doing this and counseling people appropriately. I think, mm-hmm. you know, there's so many things that could be done. And um, yeah, I look forward to see what happens kind of in that space. All right, so let's move on to some medical questions because it's such a treat to have a doctor on our show. So many places have a gestational limit of six weeks for an abortion, but what is actually going on with a six-week-old fetus? Totally. So um, keep in mind, again, pregnancy is dated from the last menstrual period. So day one of what is a pregnancy is actually the first day of the preceding period. And so at about two weeks, again, assuming a 28-day cycle, that's when you would expect ovulation to happen and a fertilization occurs and this embryo makes its way down to the uterus for implantation. And um, it's at the four-week mark where, again, with regular periods, that the person would miss their period, right? So six weeks of pregnancy is actually really just two weeks after missing you know, one's period. So it's really not that long after, you know, you Mm -hmm. would be notified that something is going on um, differently in your body. And that's if you have regular cycles. At six weeks on ultrasound, on a transvaginal ultrasound, not an abdominal scan, you would be able to see a tiny embryo. It's about the size of a bean. There's, you know, very small limb buds that are starting to be formed. Um, a hump for where the head is going to be formed is also seen at this point. And at most times on the transvaginal ultrasound, you could see a heartbeat. And I just have a question about this because it actually came up in our last episode. Is it a true heartbeat or more just like a a pulse, like just, just for our education purposes Yeah, here? totally. So, so the circulation is set up very early in an embryo. Okay. Um, and that's because, as you can imagine, as something grows beyond being just a couple of cells in order to nourish all of the cells that are part of their system, they need to have a circulatory system. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, it's a very rudimentary heart at that point, but it is the start of what will be you know, the heart of this fetus moving forward is just at a very, very tiny rudimentary form at that point in their development. Okay. Yeah. I'm kind of thinking of like the fertilized chicken egg where you start to see like all the red veins through it, even though there's not really like a whole lot else going on. Yeah, exactly. And so that circulatory system has to be set up so that um, they're able to continue growing because otherwise, how are the nutrients going to get distributed? How otherwise will this growing thing be able to get rid of their waste and things like that? So right, that's uh, one of the very first things to be set up. Right. And now this is just kind of a, a dumb question probably for you, but you know, for the pro birthers, this is a legitimate question, but is that feed is actually viable outside of the womb? So not, there, there are no <laughs> stupid questions. Um, the fetus is not viable outside of the womb at six weeks. Absolutely mm-hmm. not. They are like the size of a bean. Viability is defined as 24 weeks, sometimes as low as 23, depends on the center and what they're able to provide in terms of resuscitation, as well as being 500 grams. 
So if this is a really tiny baby because there is some medical problem in the mom, you know, the patient carrying the pregnancy or in the baby themselves, and they're not yet 500 grams, but they're past 24 weeks, they probably are not going to make it in terms of having a reasonable chance, so like an over 60% chance of surviving outside of the womb. And that's surviving, you know, if it's 24 weeks, surviving usually with significant complications to their life moving forward. Right. So very different from the uh, messaging that pro-birth people are putting out there. You know, a lot of their messaging is, is, you know, this is a fully formed human and they mm-hmm. can survive outside the womb. And it's it's just not true. You know, it's just, it's just not, yeah, it's ridiculous. Just not true. Just not true. Um, you know, people who are the size of a bean cannot survive outside of the womb. You know, <laughs> here, a six week old embryo, um, you know, they're not, there's no way that they would be able to survive outside of the womb. And even for, you know, like a 23 week size fetus that is normally grown for their gestational age will have an incredibly hard time with maximal support, you know, in a level three NICU being able to survive. So um, it's definitely not as advertised in the crisis pregnancy centers or by the pro, you know, the forced birth kind of movement. Those flyers. Yeah. Laura got on her doorstep too. Uh, (laughs) You got the flyer. (laughs) Uh, yeah, she I got the did. Flyer. And the irony is I I got one um, and there was a chemist all over my street on the mm-hmm. eve that we released our very first abortion episode. <laughs> and I, was, <laughs> I was like, they know. Oh, my God. How do they know? <laughs> but they it was know. just it was recorded. Yeah. But it was just so disturbing because like I myself, like I'm aware that, you know, it's it's a fetus, right? It's not it's not a human. It's not a fully formed human. But for like a, a child who wouldn't know or, or it, really anyone, they could read that and be like, oh my gosh, this is, this is yeah. awful. This must be true. Yeah. And yeah. it's just, I could, I could go on about that, but I won't. Um, it, it's just all this misinformation that it, it, we can't be putting out into our communities because it's just so false. Totally. And I would even like bring that further and say, you know, people with uteruses have been told lies about their bodies forever. And it's only mm-hmm. very recently that people have been actually educated on what happens in their body. Like every time I do, you know, visits related to menstruation or whatever, I always try to fit in a, a tiny, like, this is what's going on in your body. Did you know that this is what's happening with the hormones and the lining is being shed and et cetera, et cetera, so that people understand, you know, why we recommend the things that we do and can kind of follow along with what the reasoning is, because otherwise it's like, oh, you just want me to take this medication for what? And it's like, there, you know, there's some reasoning behind it. And then when you tell people, they're like, oh, that's why I was prescribed that medication. Okay, I'll start taking it now. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) For so many years, we've been taught that the body is a dirty place, you know, we shouldn't Mm -hmm. talk about it, we need to keep it hidden. But really, it's this like incredible piece of engineering. And all the things that it can do, it's absolutely incredible. And, you know, we need to be talking about it and celebrating it and really understanding everything about it. Exactly. I totally agree. I think, you know, the uterus, the ovary, like, what amazing organs like the uterus is able to replenish its lining every single month you know and shed its cells and then regrow itself based on like hormone response from um, what's being given off by the ovaries and it's this whole intricate system that you know needs to you know have pieces from different places and there's signals that are back and forth i think you know, people's bodies are amazing. And that's part of why, (laughs) you know, I chose to do medicine and I think it's really interesting. But I also think, you know, knowledge is so much power and like teaching people about what's going on with their bodies is, you know, something that I find very, very gratifying in the line of work that I do. Oh, absolutely. I just like can totally see why you would get into medicine for this reason. Like just, just unlock all the body's secrets. And 
this kind of leads really nicely into um, one of our last questions here is what can women expect when going for an abortion and how does it change depending on how far along uh, the person is, you know, like when is it a good option to take the Miffy pill or move more into surgical? Yeah, I, I think that's a great question. So the medical abortion is really best before nine weeks, maybe 10 weeks, depends on the center. And so that, you know, that would have to be someone who's fairly sure of their menstrual cycle if we were doing this without an ultrasound, which is totally okay to do. Just again, want to make sure that the person is very sure of their dates. So before 10 weeks, really either a surgery surgery or doing the medication option is reasonable. After 10 weeks, it becomes really only surgical options. And you know that's because the pill will only work for so big of an embryo. And so the way that those things go is for a surgical option that's before 14 weeks, usually people can show up and on the same day have their procedure. There might be some cervical preparation, so the cervix being the opening to the uterus, it sits at the top of a vagina. There might be some pills that need to be inserted. You know, they might have to show up to the clinic like an hour or two before their procedure to have that put in or be given those pills to take, you know, um, the morning of their procedure or something like that by mouth and have it dissolve in their mouth. That can make the cervix easier to open, so easier to get access to because, of course, the pregnancy is sitting in the uterus and we would use like a straw-like device to go through the cervix and either use um, a manual vacuum aspiration, so something that's put under suction and is done just by hand, or it could be like a machine-like device that creates a suction with um, some tubing. And so that could be done, again, usually up to 14 weeks, they can do the procedure in the same day. When it gets to be after 14 weeks, the procedure gets to be more complicated. And um, it usually takes a bit more of a different skill set, a little bit more of an advanced skill set to be able to do those procedures. And so usually after 14 weeks, the person will need to have some type of cervical preparation done at least the day before. So what will happen is the person will get laminaria or these rod-like devices put into the cervix that helps to open up the cervix over time so that when you're doing the procedure, you have an easier time at being able to get the instrument and the instrument sizes that you need, those straws, through the cervix into the uterus to get at where the pregnancy is. I would say once you get to be really like after 18 weeks, that's when the, the you have to use kind of two sets of instruments. So at that point, it's really called a uh, dilation and evacuation. And that's the, the dilation piece being the opening up of the cervix and evacuation, meaning not only are they going to use the straws to help suck out the fluid and other small things that can come out that way, but also different instruments that are capable of going through the whole, you know, that the cervix has given us based on that preparation and be able to pull out pieces of the pregnancy. The thing to keep in mind, again, with people who are having um, this d e or dilation and evacuation kind of after the 18, 20 week span. Usually that's like a two day preparation. So the first day doing some of the inserts in the cervix and then the second day doing even more of those inserts to making sure, again, they're able to get those instruments that will need to go in to safely remove all of the pregnancy tissue. And so that procedure, um, again, around up to, pardon me, up to about the 14 week point is called the dilation and curatage because it involves not as many instruments that need to go into the uterus. You know, there's not as much pregnancy tissue that you need to retrieve. Um, But then after that, it's called a dilation and evacuation. Wow. No, thank you so much for describing that in lots of detail, because I feel like that's such a procedure that people put like a a narrative and an image to, but it's not really well understood by the public of how um, an abortion is 
carried out. So thank you so much for that. And what what can the patient kind of expect um, post procedure? Like, it, is there any aftercare, or would they kind of experience a period like uh, bleed for for a couple of days? Yeah, so it, it's different depending on the method, um, different depending on how far along you are. Um, but one resource that is actually excellent that is put out by um, the group in British Columbia, I believe, is called My Post Care. So it's a website. It's mypostcare.ca. Currently, the information on there is all about surgical termination of pregnancy, but they are starting to study medical um, termination of pregnancy and what that aftercare should look like in um, what they should provide in terms of resources. So, you know, it's normal to have some bleeding after the procedure. It's not normal if your period does not come back after seven weeks of the procedure. It's not normal if a month after you still have a positive pregnancy test. You know, there's pretty strict criteria of things that are normal and are not. And so um, I'll leave that to the the listeners to kind of go to that website and review, but certainly it differs based on, you know, the type of abortion that the person has had and usually a little bit of how far along they are at the time. Amazing. And then kind of same question for the Miffy pill. How does that one work? I know it's, it, it, there's three pills that you take, I believe. Yeah. So there's actually, so in the Miffy Guy Miso, which is the product that's marketed in Canada, there's the Mifepristone, which is a progesterone blocker. So the patient would take that by mouth and that medication, you know, progesterone as the hormone kind of is named, it's pro-gestation, gestation being pregnancy. So the whole point of progesterone in the body is to support pregnancy. So if we block progesterone, then while the pregnancy is no longer going to be supported, um, that pregnancy will, you know, die as a result. Now, what happens 24 to 48 hours later is the patient will take misoprostol. So misoprostol in the Mifigai Miso is 800 micrograms, so it's usually four tablets. People can take it in their mouth, so buckily they um, would allow it to dissolve in their mouth, or it can go into the vagina, whichever. Um, and what would happen is that induces the cramping. So if you can think of, you know, when you've had your period and you have that really, really crampy, crampy nature, that is prostaglandins in your, that your body has produced itself causing the uterus to contract. And so you would take, you know, something like Advil because that is something that blocks those prostaglandins and helps with that pain. Now we are giving the opposite. We are trying to give you contractions. We are trying to give you something to stimulate the muscle, you know, the uterus as a muscle to expel what is inside. And so the combination of those two medications, the progesterone blocker and the one that causes those, that cramping pushes that pregnancy out and, you know, is highly effective in like, you know, 95% of cases, people um, do very well with medical abortion. Again, if they're very sure of their dates and are selected appropriately. Oh my gosh, I'm learning so much <laughs> about all of this. I love knowing the uh, like chemical background of how it affects yeah. your body. And just, it makes so much sense. And then even when I was thinking about um, the chemical makeup of, of birth control pills, I'm like, oh, I can see why mm -hmm. they would be made up this way because that is how our body is producing these hormones. Yeah. Oh, it's so yeah. cool. It's so cool. It is so cool. I agree. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> Honestly, in another life, I've been like, man, I could have been OG, <laughs> like OB or like <laughs> midwife or something. Um, the older I get, the more like fascinated I am with like, pregnancy and how our body yeah. uh, regulates hormones and just just works in general. It's so cool. I, I totally agree. Come join us if you ever change your mind. <laughs> when I, yeah, when I'm tired of finance, I'll, I'm going yeah, to go to med yeah. school. <laughs> you got to head back to school. Anyway, though. how can our <laughs> listeners find and follow you to just tap into your wealth of knowledge? Super kind of you. So I'm on Twitter. My handle is at Ruth, so my first name M as in Mary is my for my first initial, my middle initial, pardon me, and then Hapte, my last name. Um, I'm still debating whether or not to make like a public Instagram or a public TikTok. 
I don't have those right now, but something I'm thinking about, stay tuned, maybe I'll change my mind in the future. Um, but for now it's Twitter. And, you know, I like go on Twitter fairly often. So that's a, <laughs> that's a good way to contact me. You could just be like our uh, Canadian version of Dr. Mama June. Get all the, I, think I, I, I I'm endorsing that. <laughs> you know, if you want to start a YouTube channel or an Instagram and just give us all the facts on pregnancy and and uh, like abortion rights, everything. We are we are here to be an audience. <laughs> I love that. Love it. All right. Do you have any parting thoughts for our listeners? No, I would say if any of your listeners are in British Columbia, I would just mention the Access BC campaign. Go to our website. It's www.accessbc.org. If you are so inclined and agree with our message, then click on the right to your MLA um, where you can send an email to your MLA as well as the premier urging um, you know, no cost contraception in the province. So um, that is something I would per- encourage all listeners in British Columbia to do. Amazing listeners, definitely go check that out. We actually have um, a future episode coming up with Access BC and uh, the Ontario Contraception Group, and I believe the uh, Manitoba group as well. And uh, we can't really, mm-hmm. we can't wait to talk more about birth control and how it should be accessible to everyone in Canada. Well, I'm very much looking forward to listening to uh, my colleagues from Access BC and the other sister kind of campaigns. I think it'll be a great additional episode. And yeah, I really look forward to it. Yeah, that was amazing. Thank you so much, Ruth. We hope to talk to you again in the near future. Sounds good. Great right. chatting with you guys. You too. Okay. Take care. Bye. Bye. All right. So um, hi, guys. I'm back after my internet issues. That's why I popped off for the last, um, I don't know, (laughs) 10 minutes of the episode. But uh, again, thank you so much for being here, Ruth. We really love to have you. And listeners, if you enjoyed this episode, please leave us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts or a five-star rating on Spotify. And if there's anything you want to chat about or any questions that you have, please email us. Our email is Rachel at gmail.com. We would love to hear from you. Yes, and definitely check out Dr. Ruth's Twitter account, and I'm sure she is more than happy to answer any questions that you have. And I'm keeping my fingers crossed for that YouTube channel or that Instagram Me too. channel. Me too. Yeah, yeah. watch out, out uh, Dr. Mama June. Yeah. Dr. Ruth is watch coming out. for you. She's coming. <laughs> We're just going to hype this whole thing up, and she's like, I, what? <laughs> what did I sign up for? <laughs> Uh, Uh, Anyway, that was an incredible chat. I learned so much. I hope you guys did as well. Um, uh, Dr. Ruth can come back anytime and teach us more. Yep. And we've honestly just scratched the surface there. So we hope Mm -hmm. you enjoyed. Definitely share this episode. Share all of the abortion episodes that we've published so far. And uh, definitely reach out and support these individuals and organizations that are doing this incredible work to Mm -hmm. help keep abortion and contraception accessible in Canada and improve its accessibility. Definitely. And we have so many more episodes to come. So stay tuned. We don't even know how many, to be honest. It keeps kind of just keep rolling in. So we're just we're here. We are here for it. We like learn something new each episode where we're like, oh, it'd be really interesting to talk to somebody about this specifically. And then, and then they say yes. We're like, oh my God, they said yes. So yeah, here we are. One for the series. So we hope, we hope that you are enjoying this series as much as we are. We have learned so much on this journey and it's, it's been so much fun to just kind of hone in on Canada specifically because, you know, Mm -hmm. as we said in our very first episode, we get looped into the States so often yeah. and um, it's important to distinguish the differences between other countries and Canada. Um, I believe on the Action Canada uh, Instagram right now, they are looking for individuals and organizations to endorse a uh, petition that is going on right now to ensure that 
any uh, legislation around abortion stays out of the House of Commons. So if you have a chance, go check out their Instagram. Um, it will be in our in, uh, for our show notes below and mm-hmm. uh, definitely help support them. Yes, yes. And we are going to also, again, link the talk that Ruth did that inspired a lot of the questions that we asked her today. So definitely check that out too. She provides a lot of context in that talk too that I think this episode and that will go together really well. Exactly. So if you enjoyed this episode, make sure you share it. Definitely leave a five-star review on Spotify and Apple Podcast. Rachel, any parting words? I just, I'm just taking in all that information. My mind is blown. Me too. Oh my gosh. I learned, I learned so much and just, you know what? Like I think, you know, we talked about it uh, when we did our episode with Joyce a couple weeks ago, but just having that information out there of what an abortion at different stages is actually like, I think can mm-hmm. do such, such good work at just reducing the stigma. Cause like, it's just, it's a medical procedure. Yes. And it's, we need to normalize it. Like there doesn't, we don't have to be hushed and whisper about it. No, absolutely not. And, um, you know, just talking about and hearing the step-by-step of what to expect, especially for uh, the timeframes, that just demystified it so much for me Mm -hmm. because Mm -hmm. I I didn't know a um, under 14 weeks procedure is different from uh, you Did know, you and know? over and over four weeks and in under 10 weeks, you do the pill. Like no one is really putting this out in the public. And mm-hmm. so I love that we have a professional like Dr. Ruth come on and, and just break it down and being like, hey, this is what happens. It's no big deal. You know, if you're further along, we have to do something a little bit different, but still mm-hmm. you're going to mm-hmm. be fine. And for sure. This is just something that uh, you have done and then you carry on, right? Yep. Like it's, it was just so nice to have a, um, a very uh, like nonchalant con- conversation about it. And yeah, where like it's, it's just, just knowledge. very normalized. Yeah, it was just sharing knowledge and it felt so normal. You know, it didn't feel like we shouldn't be talking about this. About yeah. Because we should. Did. We should be talking about it. I mean, one in three people have an abortion at some time in their life that Mm -hmm. that's like we said before that's a lot of people and um it should just be an open conversation if that person chooses and people who might be faced with that decision they should have um a resource to go to and it should just be like oh okay it's like going to the dentist right this is (laughs) this is how they clean my teeth right or fix a cavity you know it's it's just a medical procedure Yep. And just to reiterate one of her points um, for the pro birthers around there, Mm -hmm. um, a six week fetus cannot survive outside of the womb. Therefore, it's not viable. You've heard it here from a doctor. Thank you. (laughs) (laughs) Slow clap. Sorry, I'm just clapping in the background here. Yay. (laughs) And even when you get to like 20 weeks, it would be real, real difficult. Yes. Thank yeah, you. It, uh, it's just so nice to kind of have someone spill the facts there and be like, come on, people. You know, it's it's not going to be a bean-sized human running around That doesn't here. even have limbs yet. No, not even in a head. You know, it's no. like she said, it's just like little little buds, all right? And um, Literally I, a bean. Yes, and I love that. The facts are now challenging the misinformation that is in those pamphlets that I'm still pissed off about. I, I, I'm pissed off for you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm I think we should all be outraged. And yeah. I don't want to spill the – I was going to say the beans. But maybe, <laughs> like why am I stuck yeah. on beans? Um, you know, just to, to leak a future episode, we are going to be having a certain discussion with a certain group that mm-hmm. did help make those flyers and signs in their city illegal. Mm-hmm. And with that, mm-hmm. live like tea. Live like tea. <laughs> <laughs>